This is a very strange and, uh, nebula that has been created by the explosion of a star uh, producing uh, hydrogen, which is in red, and oxygen, which is in blue. It took me about eight, 18 hours of uh, integration with my camera to capture it. Yes, over a couple of nights, I don't remember how many nights I had to devote to this. But this is another story altogether. Okay, so uh, without wasting too much time, I'll take over from here by uh, focusing on one of those particular applications of RDA, which is the possibility of running actually the equivalent of a MANOVA, of a multivariate ANOVA. As you may, as you may know, multivariate ANOVA, the classical one, the parametric one, is plagued by a lot of constraints. Conditions of applications are quite stringent. You have to uh, have the data that are multivariate uh, normal. Uh, you have uh, that homogeneity of variances. Well, oh, that one has to be respected for, for, for uh, uh, RD as well. But also, you have uh, stringent conditions about the number of uh, observations versus the number of variables and so on and so forth, number of groups. So this ma makes it very difficult to apply in, uh, uh, for ecological data. Uh, whereas RDA offers an elegant alternative to this and uh, offers the additional possibility of the permutation tests, which are, of course, a great improvement, and also uh, the triplot representation of results, which a, a MANOVA, a classical MANOVA, does not offer at all. So, uh, conceptually, to do this, you have to code your factors in a special way. Uh, during the first day, I showed you that uh, recoding of uh, qualitative variables in two dummy variables that were uh, binary, 0, 1. Okay? And then I told you that, uh, okay, and, and you all, uh, today again, you saw that actually you, you need one less of those dummy variables than there are numbers of, uh, of uh, uh, groups. Now, this is not fully satisfactory for ANOVA purposes for one reason. Because actually if you, uh, those uh, dummy variables are not orthogonal to one another. They are, if you, well, if you want to obtain the, uh, something to model the interaction, it does not uh, behave properly. Anyway, so uh, we have now to look for uh, another way of coding those factors. Uh, the variables must represent, of course, the experimental design exactly. The variables are, of course, uh, just one, one word. All this will work if you have a balanced design. Balanced design is the nirvana of the ANOVA. I already told you that you got into trouble when, when you don't have any balanced design. Uh, uh, one of the problems lying with that damned B fraction that appears when it's not the case and that contaminates the estimation of residuals and the test of residuals. Okay, so uh, this, is, uh, this being said, uh, though uh, our new variables are supposed to be orthogonal to one another, the interaction, when it's present, when you have to code for it, should also be properly coded as orthogonal to the main factors, and the number of variables needed to code each factor in the interaction uh, must be equal to their respective degrees of freedom. So uh, something that can be done, fortunately, by what is called Hermit contrast. I'll first show you a little example of those, and then I'll proceed to show you how they are computed in R. Uh, I've noticed that maybe it, it, it can be useful for you to have the R implementation here so you can directly go to it when you are uh, at the computer. So uh, my first example is, is here with a factor of A with three levels and factor B with two levels. And I have uh, the minimum replication within each cell being uh, uh, K or, or R equal to in this case, so a total of 12 observations. Uh, just the minimum required to test for interaction. You know that you have to have replication within the cells to test for interaction uh, to have enough degrees of freedom. So how do we code this 
with the whole Helmholtz contrast, this small example. It looks like this. Uh, remember, factor A has three, uh, uh, has three groups, three levels. So we have two variables. This is OK. And look at this. The first one provides the contrast between the first group, the first four objects which belong to the first group, and the remaining objects. <coughs> Those helmet contrasts with an orthogonal balanced design have the property of have columns that have zero sum. And now to get this first contrast, you do it this way. You put twos here and minus ones here. So if you sum up 4 times 2, you have 8, and 8 times minus 1, you have minus 8, and you sum up to 0. The second of those two variables uh, is 0 for this. We have already dealt about this contrast, so we, we don't need any more information about it. And it contrasts the two other groups by 1s and minus 1s in equal numbers. So again, we have a sum zero, a zero sum. Okay. This is the way they work. Uh, as long as you have a manageable number of, uh, of groups, it's easy to build, build them by hand. But of course, it's easier to do it with R since uh, now we have this possibility. For the other factor, it's exactly the same, except that we have only two groups. And thus, we need one variable. There's one degree of freedom for these two groups, for this factor. And uh, I have put them in the same order, so uh, of course the alternate here between uh, group 1 and group 2 of factor B. Uh, and uh, for only two groups, you have 1s uh, and minus 1s, so that globally, again, it sums up to 0. And now, the interaction. As you may know, the interaction is actually the product of the two factors. So, the logic here is to make the product of those uh, variables. So you have first variable here multiplied, so uh, the first variable of factor A, A multiplied by the, the, the only one of factor B. So 2 times 1 gives 2, 2 times minus 1 gives minus 2, and so on, uh, down here. If you sum this, you again will get 0. And the other one is, of course, the second column here multiplied by B. So uh, you have the zeros here, you have the ones here, and you, you have the minus ones here, and minus one times minus one gives one here. So remember, number of degrees of, of freedom for the interaction is number of levels minus one times minor of levels min uh, minus one for each of the groups, so the product of actually the, uh, these numbers. So here 2 times 1 gives two variables coding for the interaction. So everything is OK. We have our number of variables. And if you now would put this into an R object and call uh, matrix, computer matrix of correlation, call your uh, object here, you would obtain 0 everywhere. So these are orthogonal, uncorrelated to one another. We have fulfilled our uh, needs. Well, this warning, Pierre already told about it, and I already mentioned it before. Testing by permutation, which is what we do in RDA, does not alleviate the requirement of homogeneity within group dispersions in multivariate ANOVA and in, uh, by RDA. There are tests for univariate situations, like the Bartlett test, for instance. Bartlett test, which, by the way, requires normality. Unless you use a, a, for a permutational form of Bartlett test. And then you can test for homogeneity of variances without having normality. If you are interested, uh, give me a word and I'll handle you a permutational version of a Bartlett's test that I have uh, made up just for this purpose. But this is for univariate cases. In multivariate cases, fortunately, we have a function called beta disper in Vegan, uh, based upon a, a code written by uh, Marty Anderson, and which 
compute a test of multivariate homogeneity of within group dispersions, meaning uh, within group variances, uh, to be short. Okay? This is for the principle. Um, I have made up an example of, to be more precise, I have uh, extracted the example from the orange book here to show you how it works in practice. Uh, our do fish data, the do being a river that uh, runs along, uh, for part of it, it runs along the border between uh, Swiss, uh, Switzerland and France, uh, the northern part of the Jura Mountains. And, uh, well, there's, it's a very well-known uh, data set, this do uh, fish data collected in the 70s, I think. Anyway, it's explained in the book. So here I took 27 of those sites. I made up an artificial case, actually. I had to make this up because I had no way of extracting a balanced design with all the 29 sites. Okay, uh, 29 sites cannot be divided by anything. Okay, it's mon dieu non premier in English. Primary number, okay. So uh, of course the, it's not very comfortable. <laughs> so what did I for this? purpose only for the example, I took 27 of them, this can be divided, uh, comfortably, and I created a fictitious balanced two-way ANOVA design. I took altitude, which is a continuous variable in the data set, and I simply split it into three zones of equal numbers, three levels of, ni uh, of nine sites each. Okay, so, so uh, this, this went well. I mean, I had not to cheat in any case. I just simplified the information into three, three groups. Uh, where I get really dirty was with pH, because there uh, I, I, I checked every single other variable that I had in the data set to try to play the same kind of trick uh, without deforming the, the, the data too much, and I, really not, I, not, I, I did not really succeed. So I took... Uh, the one uh, with, uh, with which I could make up a uh, three-level factor with uh, the less possible deformation, and that was pH. So I also created a, a pH factor that grossly, this time, mimics the pH value uh, and uh, put the, puts it into three categories. Now, how did I do this in practice after that? Uh, in R. I first created my factor altitude, three levels, nine sites each in a row, of course, from the top uh, to the bottom of, uh, of, of the river, well, actually the highest to the lowest point where the samplings had been done. So this can be done with a, a, a little function in R called GL. GL, you give the number of, um, of groups, the number of levels, and the number of replicates, and you can put labels if you want, uh, otherwise it will put you uh, lab labels uh, one, two, three, which is a dangerous thing to do, otherwise you risk uh, confuse this with a, con a continuous factor. And then, of course, the dirty trick I had to play with pH dot fact because pH was uh, fluctuating in a uh, different way along the river, so I had to, uh, to put those limits where I could as best as possible, and uh, while keeping the requirement that I had, uh, I had to have nine uh, times the first level, nine times the second, and nine times the third level. So uh, this is completely artificial. Of course, you wouldn't do this uh, in any real case. It's really for the example. But if you have to construct a two-level level design, and uh, of course uh, you have your, 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 uh, your sites in a given order, and uh, it's easy to construct the first one. If you have a second one, then uh, you will have to intersperse the, uh, the levels within the levels of the first one. If you want to verify if you have not uh, made mistakes, you can al always call for a table crossing the two factors, which I did here, to verify if there was indeed uh, if there were indeed three replicates within each of the cells, and uh, as you can see, it is the case. So I have thus verified that my design is balanced with uh, my uh, 
so that, that, that we have uh, effectively uh, three observations of high altitude and uh, pH value, lowest value, one, and uh, the rest as well. Now to the real part of uh, the ANOVA or the process leading to the ANOVA. I had now to create helmet contrast for these two factors. So uh, the construction I, saw, I showed you before with my simple example. It will be possible to do it by hand. It's still manageable, as I told you. With, uh, so. But you are prone to make mistakes, and it's long, it's, it's cumbersome, and it's useless. Because we have this function called model.matrix, which has a lot of possibilities. And in this case, we are, we are using it based on the two factors that I have created, altitude.fac and ph.fac here. Uh, the sign, uh, how do we call that? In, in, well, the, senior, the tilde, yes. <laughs> Sorry, little, uh, yes. So uh, it begins here with the tilde. You use the tilde and as you see, I've put it in red. I have a multiplicative sign here. Why? Because of the interaction. It's short for alt.fac plus alt.ph.fac uh, plus alt.fac multiplied. R uh, allows us to go short. And when you, when you multiply, it does not only compute for the, the, the terms for the interaction, but for the main factors as well. And then I ask for contrasts. Uh, since I have two factors here, I have to, to give a list of types of contrasts. In each case here, it will be Helmert. So alt.fac has, has to, been, uh, to be uh, coded as contrast.helmert, and pH also is Helmert contrast. OK, so we close our brackets here. And there is still this minus the first column appearing here at the end because our function model.matrix here uh, creates a first column of, of one in case you needed uh, an intercept in some uh, uses. So this is fully useless in our case, so I remove it at the outset so we, we get rid of it uh, immediately. Uh, well, at this point, I had called them alt.fac and uh, uh, ph.fac, which made for very cumbersome column names afterwards. So uh, yesterday, uh, I just corrected this, but I, I did not change uh, this in particular. But here, I, I, just dis uh, I, I just display, using function head, I just display all the variables here, and uh, the variable names, and the six first uh, values that I have here. So as you can see, we have, I remind, remem, uh, remember now, you have three levels for each of the factors, so we expect two variables for the main effect, which is the case here. Now, it begins with the minus ones, uh, so the, the two uh, are completely at the bottom in this case, but this is unimportant. For altitude, uh, one and two here, uh, uh, six first about among the 27, so we don't see any uh, all the details. And then come the interaction terms. So here again, we have two and two, so we have to get the uh, multiplications for e uh, every possible case. So here by here, here by here, 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 and here, here. So everything has to be done uh, so as to get the interaction completely coded and with the proper numbers of degrees of freedom, which is Two by two equal four. So you, you have the four uh, columns here. So you see here, for instance, uh, for the, the, the first term of the interaction, you have those minus one by minus one giving one. For the second term, the third and the fourth term, it will be the same. So here, for instance, minus one uh, multiplied by one is minus one, minus one, minus one, one. And here again, for the last of those terms. And of course, this goes down up to, uh, down to number 27. So uh, this example is 
fully developed in the practical in two days practicals, so you you can go further. Uh, I can already tell you, but here again you have the details in the practicals. The within group dispersions here are homogeneous for this example. I was fortunate; nothing was guaranteed at the outset. <laughs> um, so the first. What do you test first in an ANOVA? In a replicated ANOVA, I should say. The first thing you have to test. Uh, after, of course, the, uh, the dispersions. You are, you, now you are in the ANOVA. What is, well, of course, when you compute an, o, an ANOVA, you have all results at a time. What is the first one, the single first one, you have to look at? No. Thanks for your courage. But it's the interaction. Because if you have interaction, you cannot interpret the terms, the, uh, the, uh, the tests for the main factors. And this goes back to that uh, famous thing that I have promised you about the interpretation of interaction, and we still not have had time enough to show. Uh, I have the slides uh, ready for you any time, but of course now uh, time is running short for this morning again. But Anyway, I, I don't give up uh, the hope of showing you this before the, the course ends. So the first thing you have to test is interaction. This is tested by permutation. You cannot put any constraint by testing the interactions. Otherwise, uh, well, for different reasons, I don't have to, uh, time to explain it. But uh, you, uh, you would have to put, if you would put constraints, it would be constraints for the first and for the second uh, uh, for the second um, main factor, and you would have uh, you would permute within the, the cells, and of course this is not possible. So you uh, test the interaction with unconstrained permutation. But this is a partial test. Pierre told about partial RDA. This is exactly the case. See, you have our species, Hellinger transformed by transformed by the way, and remind. Remember that in our matrix of helmet contrasts, contrasts 1, 2 are for the first factor, 3, 4 for the second, and then 5 to 8 are the interaction. So here, my constraining matrix, so the matrix X here is that of interaction, so the uh, terms, uh, columns 5 to 8. And I put the other ones as covariable. It's called Z, Z in uh, the W here uh, in, uh, in Vegan. So the, the covariables are the terms, the, the Helmut contrast corresponding to the two factors, uh, the, the main effects here. And I have this uh, probability here of uh, 0 0.975. Whew. Fortunately, the interaction is not significant. In this case, we are always happy because if we aim to explain the main factors or to interpret the main factors, if interaction is significant, you have to make a whole lot more an separate analysis. You have to anal analyze factor one only for the f first level, uh, factor A only uh, for the first level of factor B, and for the second and for, for the third separately, and then uh, the reverse for the other factor. So we are happy here when interaction is not significant. In some other cases, you are looking for interaction because it's, it would be the signature of some particular process. We'll see this uh, in our examples of uh, space-time interaction test that we will show you uh, later. But now, for, for now, we are happy. So test the main factor altitude. Here again, let's see the design of the, 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 the RDA itself. It's an RDA where you have, of course, uh, our response data here. We have our first uh, factor, so pH. In this case, it's pH. Uh, uh, no, 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 sorry, it's altitude.ph, uh, this is the whole matrix, so number one and two is altitude, actually. So we test for altitude here, and what we put as covariables, so we want to remove their effect, is the effect of the second factor, pH, and the interaction. You don't want to have them mixed up in this. But here, we have one supplementary constraint, and this is a constraint upon the permutations themselves. Uh, 
permutation constrained within the levels of factor pH. This means that to get your proper uh, appropriate probability, you don't want to have any effect, any possible effect of pH. If pH is significant, that means that for each level of pH, uh, you, you will have different, uh, different values in the response variables. You don't w want to have this mixed up with your test of attitude. So what you are doing is permuting your data for all altitudes, so you mix up the data corresponding to the different altitudes, because this is uh, UH0 here, hypothesis, your null hypothesis is that of no effect of altitude. But you do, is, you do this separately within the three levels of pH. So pH doesn't be mixed up during the permutations. So you mix up the altitude within the first level of pH. You mix up uh, altitude, uh, or uh, actually what we do is mix up the, the corresponding uh, uh, response values, but within uh, those, uh, those uh, pieces. And the same for the third level. So in that way, you actually don't contaminate the permutation test with the possible effect of pH. And here, as you, see, as you see, altitude is highly significant. For, I'll go uh, faster now that I have uh, explained the principle, for pH it's the same, but of course in reversed order. So we have uh, uh, va variable three and four, which code for uh, pH main effect, which are the, the constraining variables, and all the rest, so one, two, and five to eight, uh, main factor, altitude, and um, interaction, uh, these are in the uh, covariable uh, part of the analysis. And here, contrary to, to, well, actually the same principle as before, we have to permute our values so that pH gets mixed up, but altitude within each slice of altitude, because we don't want the permutation test to be contaminated by the levels of this factor. OK? And here we have no, nothing significant, as you can see. So only factor altitude is significant. Uh, it's uh, very comfortable in this case, because it allows me to show you also uh, uh, one of those bonuses that I explained, the, the other one, the first one being the permutation, and that possibility to run the permutation in restricted ways. This is a huge world uh, within this, uh, these possibilities here. Is somebody uh, pushing against a, a, <laughs> a trigger for the light? I don't understand what's happening here. Well, uh, <laughs> or I could, maybe I create the light. I don't know. Uh, so we can draw a triplot, a triplot of the. Uh, I use the trick here. Pierre showed you that you could produce two different uh, outputs in the RDA for the side scores. One being the model, the fitted values, so the exact output of the RDA itself, so the, com the linear combination of explanatory variables that generate a prediction about uh, the, the, side, the particular sites. Okay? If you have an ANOVA design like this for altitude with three levels, this type of scores will pile up all scores from altitude 1 at the same point on the ordination. Because this is the prediction. This site is belonging to altitude number 1. OK? Same for 2, same for 3. The other, one, the, the other type of scores is based on the original response data. So. Uh, you apply, instead of using the fitted side scores, uh, the fitted uh, values of the regressions, you use the original ones and you multiply by matrix U. This preserves the variability among the side that is actually not explained by the RDA. This is why we don't recommend in general terms to use these. Uh, these scores, these scores, which are simply called side scores, the first one that appear in uh, in Vegan, but in 
this particular case here, it is useful because it will show you the dispersion of the sites around uh, the predicted positions. So you have here uh, the altitude, the low altitude with the corresponding sites, so the, the, those uh, downstream, mid altitude and high altitude. And uh, those are the fitted site scores, site scores which are linear combinations of environmental variables for those who have uh, used the uh, Kanoko, and uh, well, fitted modern site scores. And these, one, these ones around them are the site scores. Uh, based upon the original uh, response data. So you see, it gives you an interesting view because you have both the location of the centroids uh, and the predicted uh, positions and the dispersion among these uh, centroids. And of course, on top of that, since we are dealing with an RDA triplot, uh, you have as well the arrows corresponding to the species. So you have obviously were a couple of them that are uh, to be found in the mid-ranges of the river. Those, uh, this one especially in, in the lower uh, parts, and these in the upper part of the river. So we have a rich interpretation, something that is richer than you could have simply with, uh, uh, with a MANOVA, multivariate ANOVA, traditional one, that you could simply not apply to that kind of data anyway. So, okay, I'll finish there, uh, and uh, at 2 o'clock, and uh, like Pierre, I'll, I'll uh, start at 2 o'clock, zero, zero, <laughs> in this room, for a change, because the second part of my theory, theory talk will be about selection of explanatory variables, and it will be here. So, see you at, uh, during lunch and later. <laughs>